Hello, this English Language A-Level video is all about your paper two, language discourses, question four. So this is the one where you are writing an opinion text. There's the question itself. Write an opinion article about whatever the subject was in which you assess the ideas and issues raised in text A and B and argue your own views. So this is not an essay that you're writing. It needs to be a journalistic piece of writing. And it's marked in terms of two AOs. A total mark is out of 30. So it's fewer marks for this one than your question three, which was marked out of 40. And on this one, it's marked for AO2 and AO5. Now, the AO2 is about theories and concepts. So that gets a mark out of 20. And then your AO5 is about your creativity. So it's about to what extent are you able to use a, a style that's appropriate for your audience and your purpose and your genre. So let's deal with that first of all. Opinion article, stylistic features. Here we go. You need to start off with a clever headline. So it may be the last thing that you think of, but there needs to be something clever going in your headline. It's not just obvious, perhaps a play on words, perhaps some kind of intertextual reference. You then need to have a clear byline. And in the byline, which is the sentence that you put underneath the headline, that summarizes how you will be arguing in this piece. Then you need some kind of engaging start. You need something going on at the beginning, which is really going to hook the reader. It could be some kind of visual image. It could be a joke. It could be some kind of pragmatic reference or a question or an anecdote or a startling statistic. There needs to be something that captures the reader's interest at the very beginning. You need to be writing in fairly short paragraphs. This is not an essay that you're writing. So it needs to be quite short and punchy. Sent I would say paragraphs of no more than four sentences. And there needs to be lots of variety. Variety not only in the lexis that you use, but certainly in the grammatical forms, the sentence forms. So variety in sentence length, with occasionally you pitching in very, very short sentences. And variety in sentence types, so simple, complex, compound. And of course, variety in sentence functions as well. So don't just write the whole thing in boring old declaratives, but throw in some interrogatives in times and imperatives. So variety in sentence forms is very, very important. Other stylistic features would include cohesive devices. I just mentioned there about interrogative forms. It's a good idea to end paragraphs with questions. And that way you're going to be tempting your reader to keep on going with your article, keep reading it. Uh, ironic humor. This is not an essay, so use some level of humour and maybe you could achieve that with some deliberate shifts in register to lighten the tone. Um, you want a range of vocabulary. You certainly don't want to be repeating the key words again and again. So you need to be thinking of what synonyms could you use. And there needs to be very neat, concise explanation of linguistic concepts. OK, so it's no use just saying, well, Giles created the accommodation theory. It needs to be glossed in some way. So, for example, it would be a British linguist by the name of Howard Giles, who invented the grandly titled accommodation theory. His research focused on the way we slip and slide between formal and more informal forms of lingo, depending on our listener. Now you notice there how this is not using an overly academic style. It's giving you the linguistic AO2 information about Giles's accommodation theory, but it's glossing it for the kind of non-specialist reader. Now, AO2 then, what sorts of theorists could you be including? There are a few here that no matter what subject that you're doing, they're always useful to have. Howard Giles's accommodation theory and the page numbers that I'm referring to are the page numbers in the AQA textbook here. So Giles's accommodation theory, where he's talking about convergence and divergence, they're always useful for references. You also have uh, Martin Yaus and his five levels of register, because quite often when you've got articles going on, uh, you've got these contrasts in register which are happening and they may create some of the humour that you're coming across. You've got Grice's conversational maxims. If for example, you've got articles which are about speech in some way and talk. 
then it may well be that Grice's conversational maxims, which looks at violations in the kind of rules of everyday talk, that might be useful. So we're talking quality, quantity, manner, and elephants, sorry, relevance. What else have we got? We've got Storm and Norman, we've got Norman Fairclough, and this is important in terms of instrumental and influential power, and also synthetic personalization, because quite often journalists use language to synthetically personalize. And also another theorist that is always quite useful is about Goffman, because it's Goffman who introduces the concepts of negative and positive face and negative and, po and positive politeness strategies. Negative face, remember, doesn't mean being negative. Negative face means using respectful, detached, polite language in order to not tread on the toes of the listener or the reader. So giving space and giving options to them. That's negative face, whereas positive face means using language in a complimentary and praising way. Now, there are all sorts of different theorists that you could draw upon. It, it really depends on the articles that you've been given. Here, I've just done a very brief A to Z of some of the key ones that you will come across mostly in the AQA textbook. Gene Aitchison is really useful when you've got people talking about language change, because of course, she's got her three metaphors the damp spoon syndrome, the uh, infectious disease, a crumbling castle. Those three metaphors are explained in the textbook on page 218. They're useful. We have Paul Baker, who's written an article about Polari on page 185 and 186. That's quite useful if you're grappling with the notion of kind of secret coded languages like cryptolects. So maybe, for example, you're looking at aspects of Cockney rhyming slang and Polari. So Paul Baker's work on that is quite useful. We have Bernstein, who introduced in the 1960s the idea of sort of middle class and working class language. So look at his codes. So elaborated code for middle class language, restricted code for working class language. We've got Judith Butler in the gender section there who coins this abstract noun performativity. We have Deborah Cameron who really leads the charge on the diversity model in gender. That's on pages 178 and 179. You've got Jenny Cheshire, who did that study in Reading in 1982 on children's playground language. So that was interesting in terms of gender. You've got other ones here, Coates and Pilkington, uh, who basically agree with Deborah Tannen in terms of the gender difference model. You've got, tucked away in a different section, I think it's actually under CLD, you've got the work of Coulthard and Sinclair, who are particularly looking at adjacency exchanges, either kind of ritualistic patterns that you see in everyday speech. And they did work on IRF, that means initiation response feedback. Well, it's put in the book there in terms of child directed speech, but actually it's useful in terms of other occupational discourses, like, for example, what goes on in classrooms, IRF. We have Drew and Heritage, who are not mentioned in the textbook, but they did some of the key characteristics that you can find in occupation, so talk at work. We have teenage language, so we've got various pieces of research done by Eckert and Stenstrom. We have other gender studies, so we have Fishman with the gender dominance model, and we've got Janet Hyde, who in response to the difference approach, comes forward with the gender similarities hypothesis. There's a second slide here where I put some other possible uh, theorists that you might want to refer to. In terms of language change, we have the work of Haugen, who looked at the four part process of standardization. All right, so um, let's think now. We've got codification as the second one, and we've got implementation as the fourth one, and we've got two others. So look those up, they're on page 217 in the textbook. You've got Gary Ives and his good old Bradford and South London study. That's quite good at looking at things like uh, code switching. Um, we have Kurzweil and Milroy, uh, there's quite a nice little section in the book there about dialect levelling, the reasons behind UK dialect levelling. 
we have Jennifer Jenkins with her work on English as a lingua franca. Uh, we have Kachru with his models of world Englishes. And then we've got William Labov, who's done various studies, but the big standout ones, I suppose, from the textbook are Martha's Vineyard study, and then there's the New York Department Store study as well. We have uh, Robin Lakoff, who comes forward with the gender deficit model. And then we've got a mention on page 219 of Donald McKinnon and the binary way that people often talk and write about language change. Linguistic relativity is a really interesting concept to uh, present sometimes if it's relevant in an article that's sometimes known as the sapir wharf hypothesis. We have Schneider with his five part uh, model of post-colonial Englishes. We also have Dale Spender and also Deborah Tannen herself, of course, in terms of gender dominance model. And I put three others on here. We've got Peter Trudgill with his work that he's done about the links between language and social class. You've got the information about Claire Wood's texting research. It's referenced on page 171. She's from Contra University. It's looking at the linkage between children using non-standard language forms and the amount of texting that they do. And then you've got people like Zimmerman and West who go around Californian campuses recording conversations and looking particularly at interruptions that are going on in gender. Now, that is not an inclusive list that has everything that you possibly need, but it's certainly a start. And if you're marching into a language discourses exam, then you certainly need to know the vast majority of these so that, you know, some of them might be useful as AO2 in this magazine article. And let's have a think about this magazine article. Let's give you an example of uh, one I prepared earlier. So let's imagine that you've just read two articles which are about occupational language and particular about people's subject specific lexis, i.e. jargon. So you need to start off with an interesting headline. So turning the jargon off, on, off. So there's an attempt at wordplay and humour in the headline. And here's the byline. Paul Heselton argues that complaints about others' jargon are understandable, but often misguided. In a nutshell, this is a summary of what the whole article is about. And it's important that you make your byline completely different to your headline. We then start off with our first paragraph. Of course, AO1 and AO2 both need bolstering in the next NEA. My wife and I both nodded vigorously. Neither of us had any idea what my son's history teacher might mean by this mysterious combination of letters and numbers. It certainly sounded impressive, but like much of the educational jargon served up for us at the year 10 parents evening, it seemed more designed to bemuse than enlighten. So I'm trying to capture the reader's attention by giving a anecdote, a personalised piece of experience. So there you've got a direct quotation, supposedly, from history teacher. You've got some humour with my wife and I both nodding vigorously. And it's introducing in a light touch way this whole topic of educational jargon. And notice how I'm using things like coordinating connectives at the beginnings of sentences to give a sense of cohesion. So I'm leading the reader from sentence through to sentence. The linguist Norman Fairclough noted how the use of language in public situations is all about power. Jargon, a Norman French borrowed word with a literal meaning of the twittering of birds, is a supreme demonstration of this power play. Now we're starting to cook with gas because we're doing the AO2. So whereas we've had the introduction to the topic in the first paragraph, the second paragraph is now actually beginning to introduce an AO2 concept which you're going to get marked for. So the mention of Norman Fairclough, the explanation about language and power, and then the etymology of this word jargon, those are all AO2 concepts and theories. It is sometimes argued that this highly specialised coded language used by social workers, magistrates, insurance companies and the like is deliberately designed to exclude and indeed mislead the outsider. Jargon, it is said, is the current day Polari. 
the homosexual language heard in swinging 60s London, a secret language or cryptolect used to mystify those not in the know. An older comparison might be to the Cockney rhyming slang of the East End streets in the 1830s, a lingo created by petty thieves to escape detection by the world's first newly established police force. The bobbies on the beat might have had decisive instrumental power, but the canny pickpockets had the power of jargon on their side. Would you, Adam and Eve it? So there's all sorts of AO2 theories and concepts that are coming through here, aren't they? So don't box yourself in so that you think that, right, think too narrowly about the theories and concepts. Here, I know the original articles were about occupational jargon, but why not bring in other sorts of codes? In this case, I've shown to my examiner that I understand about Polari. I've given something about the history of that language. And I've linked it in with Cockney rhyming slang as well. Even though that's not occupational jargon, it's still one of these exclusive uh, pieces of language. And notice how I keep varying the word language. I don't want to keep, I've used the word language there, for example. I don't want to use it again in the next sentence. So in the next sentence, I've used the word lingo. This is what I mean about using variation, lexical variation. Notice also about the sentence variation in terms of the sentence forms. Would you add an evit? So it's a single paragraph, a single short sentence, and it's an interrogative. So it, it keeps the reader, hopefully, awake. So jargon has been with us for many a century. A recent study into the language of Northeast mining terms unearthed some interesting local specialist terms. Blah, blah, blah. And there I can present some of the information that's in the textbook there about those uh, the, the mining terms. OK, so that's the sort of tone that you need to be hitting for your question for uh, opinion text. Thanks very much.